Well, my heart isn't it. Are you all glad to be here this Sabbath? Yes. So happy Sabbath to you all. The title of my message today is A Macedonian Call. I've currently been reading the book of Philippians, and in my study I found out some information there that I just wanted to share with you all this morning, this afternoon. Now before I do begin, um, next week we'll be camp meeting, the NEC camp meeting, so um, I have to be there for the whole week along with the other workers of the conference, but fortunately I won't be here for the music day next week, but I do pray and hope you have such a blessed time, um, and a great time singing praises to the Lord. Do pray for us whilst we're down there, because we are hoping to see a revival and a reformation mm-hmm. amongst the churches of the NEC and further afield. But it has to begin in our homes and in our local churches too. Yes. Uh, so let's keep ourselves in prayer at that time as well. And for the time always, that the Father will bestow His Holy Spirit upon our hearts, mm-hmm. and that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit's presence. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. Before I do begin, I'd like to open with a word of prayer, so I'd ask you to bow your heads with me as I approach God's throne. Can this? Dear Lord, again we come before you and we thank you for your loving kindness and your mercy. Father, as I share just some information from your word today, from the books of Acts and the book of Philippians, I pray that it will serve to inspire and encourage everybody who's here. Father, you did a mighty work through the Apostle Paul and those who were with him. And I pray that we won't just look at those alone and say, well, they did great things and think we can't do great things for you. If we put faith in you, we can achieve the turning of the world upside down for you. But Father, we have to have faith in you. I pray that as I'm speaking, I believe that these are your words and not my own. Hide me in you, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, move upon the hearts. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will move upon the hearts of those who are present here today. In Jesus' precious name, we all say, Amen. Amen. If you turn again with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16, now, my sermon today, I want to focus on a number of, on several scriptures in the book of Acts, and then look at some scriptures in closing of the message. We'll read. Uh, some of the a few verses from the book of Philippians. But have you ever wondered who comprised the churches? Who made up those churches as we read the letters that were written to those churches? So over the past few, over, over the past week, I've decided to start doing and spending some time just studying specific books of the Bible and looking at the history and what was taking place around the time of that book. And I was guided to the book of Philippians, so I started reading Philippians, and it starts off with Paul introducing himself and Timothy and calling themselves fun servants and everything else. But did you know that the church at Philippi was the first church that opened the doors to the gospel being preached to the whole of Europe? Yeah, it was. And when you read about the people who would have comprised the church, you actually read about them in the book of Acts. So if you go with me to the book of Acts chapter 16, And before this, before Paul actually went to Macedonia to go and proclaim the gospel, he actually wanted to go to Asia. And the Holy Spirit said no. He wouldn't let him go to Asia. Then Paul wanted to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit stopped them from going to Bithynia. Which shows me that there's times when we may want to do certain things, but God has to stop us because he has another plan for us. So even when you have been putting all of your efforts to go into one direction, one uh, pastor said to me once, do all you can to open the doors. But if the doors are closed, be prepared for another one to open for you. It doesn't mean that we have to lose faith in God. It simply means he has another plan. He has another plan. You see, if Paul went to Asia, then maybe with the influence he had, it may not have been put into spreading the gospel to the rest of Europe. So God had another plan for Paul. And if we look at verse 9, Paul, whilst they were coming down for, to tra- tra- us, in verse 9 it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after the vision, immediately It says, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us 
to preach the gospel to them. Now, is the writer speaking in a singular form or in a plural form? It's plural, isn't it? Because he's saying we and then us. You see, the thing is, when Paul was traveling to preach the gospel, he didn't travel alone. He went with a group of people who wanted to proclaim the gospel wherever they went. So Paul was traveling with a group of guys, and that group, you find Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke, was also the one who wrote the book of Acts. And those books were actually written because Luke wanted to share the testimony of Jesus Christ with Theophilus. So Paul, Luke is writing the book of Luke, and Luke is saying, immediately we went. But he didn't only travel with Luke, there was also Silas and also Timothy. And there were others who were traveling with them. So Paul had a missionary team who were traveling wherever he would go, which shows that when we're doing the work, we're not to just do it alone. We do it together as a team. Amen. 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 In fact, as I've been reading the book of Philippians, I do think about this church. This church pops into mind, and I'll explain why in the closing of my message. So Paul makes his way. Now, you, may, you, know, you read the cities of the Bible. It would do you well to use the maps at the back of the Bible so you can get a type of picture to see where Paul was traveling from and to, etc. Now, Paul, as he was traveling, how many miles do you think it took him to go from Troas to Macedonia? How many miles? Did I hear someone say 10? Who said 20? Someone said 30, Sister Adair? No, not 30. It's not 300, it's below 300. <laughs> I see a hand at the back. 50? No, not 50. And don't forget, they're traveling by boat. And there's no motors. <laughs> no motors in this boat. How many miles? You, you go as high as 300, then you go as low as 50, and then you can't come up with any other number. <laughs> It was 125 miles. So from the time of Paul receiving this message, he has a vision. It doesn't say that they said, oh, let's wait a few days. It says immediately they went. Now, 125 miles by boat, trusting in the wind and, and maybe rowing. How long do you think it took them? It took five days. Five days for them. To, to go, in fact, as you're reading through some commentaries, it would say that they were ahead or the wind was helping them because the currents of the sea would have been pushing them the other way. Mm -hmm. So they had the winds guiding them and helping them get to Macedonia. Now, if you stay there with me in chapter 16, if we go from verse 12, it says, and from there, the, the verse 11 speaks about some of the other cities that where they were traveling through to get there. It says, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Now, whilst they were staying in that city, now Philippi was a colony, it was a Roman colony, and they decided to stay there. But Philippi, you read, it was the foremost of Macedonia. It doesn't mean that it was the key city of Macedonia. What it means is that as you would be approaching in, Philippi probably would have been the first city that you would have seen. So it's the first city that Paul and his team went to. Now, they stayed there for a few days. Now imagine, they don't have text message. They don't have email. They don't have any form of EE -E or, or Vodafone or whatever other connection you may be with. They've got prayer and trusting by faith to go where the Lord sent them. Paul has a vision. He sees a man saying, come over to Macedonia to help us. They go to Macedonia. What would you do next? The next thing I'd hope that we do is pray. And be asking the Lord, you know, where do we go next and what do we do? But actually what took place was that next day, Paul and his team enjoyed the Sabbath. So if you look here in verse 13, it says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city. And where did they go to? They go to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So I want you to imagine, it's a nice Sabbath today, isn't it? Isn't it a blessed time when the church sometimes goes for a walk on a Sabbath day and you can enjoy that time together? Well, this Sabbath day, Paul and his team, they go by the riverside. 
And as they're by the riverside, they meet the women there. Prayer is customarily made there. And they're enjoying that time there together. But there was a woman by the name of Lydia. Lydia. Now look at this. It says, verse 14, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. Now, she was a businesswoman. She's a seller of purple. Now, do business people come into contact with many people? Yeah. They do. Yeah. In fact, as, as my wife was, as we were getting ready this morning and she put on her purple <laughs> garments, I was like, oh, I should call you Lydia today. <laughs> but imagine, as people saw other people wearing purple, who would they have thought of? Lydia. Lydia. They must have bought that from Lydia. You know, the, today we've got name brands and people when they see certain types of clothes, they say, oh, that's that type. That, that's made by those or that. Did someone say Armani? I don't have no Armani. You may say next or something. Well, you get what I mean. The point is that Lydia was a woman of influence. And what we read here in the text is that as we continue reading, uh, she's a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. Then it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Now it's interesting because Paul sees a man, but the people who he's reaching out to are a group of ladies by the riverside. He goes on. And when she and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to stay, come to my house and stay. And then Paul says, She persuaded us. Or Luke wrote down that she persuaded us to stay. So Lydia's house became a missionary post for that church in Philippi when the people, when missionaries would be going through to share the gospel, she would be one of those people who would have opened her home to receive the church. Which speaks to me of the willingness and the openness that we should have as a church today. You know, a lady approached me at um, a church last week and she said, you know, some brothers came to me and they said, can we use your house? just to do some Bible studies and to do small groups here. And she said, I opened up my house and it's been a blessing. Mm -hmm. So I want to just encourage you all that you may not be able to get around and do all the door knocking and get out on the streets, but if you have a home, be prepared that the Lord may need it, may need use of it. Do you understand what I mean? So in this day and age, there's a way that all of us can help in the spreading of the gospel. So you have Lydia. Now understand, <coughs> Lydia and her household didn't just mean her and her children. It meant those servants who would have been with her, family members, work colleagues. Her whole household was baptized when they heard the words of the gospel preached. Isn't that amazing? So what we have here now, Lydia is one of those people who hears the gospel and begins to form the church of Philippi. But it doesn't stop with Lydia, does it? Does it start with Lydia? No way. You see, as they continue there, we bump into what was called a demon-possessed damsel. Continue reading with me. Go to verse 16 to 19. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. So I'm going to read down to verse 15. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, that these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many day, days. Now let me ask you something. Was what she was, was it true? The words that she was saying, were they true? Yes. Was there a problem with her following them and saying these words? There must have been, because as you read the verses after, it says, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour, but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. What's just happened? You've got this damsel who's following and she's saying, these men are the servants of the most high God. They're preaching the truth. They're doing the work and Paul gets annoyed. Paul rebukes the, this demon, he leaves the girl alone, she suddenly has no more power to do any 
divination or to bring the, the leaders of the city any money, and then they get put in prison. You see, brothers and sisters, there's times when if Paul did not rebuke the spirit that was speaking through her, it would have caused problems for the gospel later yes. on in Europe. And I'll explain why. You cannot be connected to Satan and <coughs> proclaim the gospel and there's no problems. Mm. You see, what Satan will try to do is attach himself to the gospel so that the works that he's doing, which is against the gospel, will look as if they're okay. Mm. So these people who would have been going to her for their fortune telling, she, they would have said, well, we've heard the words of Paul and we heard you saying that they're doing the works of God, so maybe you've got some truths to tell us. But she would have been directing them to Satan. Dangerous, isn't it? So Paul rebukes this spirit, and suddenly this, this, this damsel, this, this servant girl, has no more power. And then the leaders of the city get upset. They imprison Paul and Silas, and they get beaten. But the point that I want to make is this. We cannot be connected to the things of the world and expect to proclaim the gospel of God. Do you understand me? And I'll give some examples. I remember years ago, as I was walking through the streets, when I made my conversion to come to Jesus Christ, I told all of my friends so that they knew not to bother me with the worldly stuff anymore because I didn't want to do the things. So one of them tried to persuade me in the town center, Birmingham city center. Uh, it was the days when CNA and all of those shops used to be there on the main street. I see smiles because some of you remember. And I remember as I was walking through, one of my friends, yo, great, great. Stop. He says, I've got something for you. You're going to like this. So he said, put my headphones up. Now this guy walked with headphones wherever he went. And he wasn't listening to the gospel. So he says to me, come listen to this. Now in my head, I'm thinking, I don't want to listen to the nonsense you're listening to. So he comes to me and says, no, no, just listen, just listen. I promise you, you will be shocked. He puts the, the, the things on my ears, he presses play, and then I'm hearing Kanye West. And I said, I don't want to listen to this stuff. He says, no, 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 just listen, listen to the chorus. And it's Jesus Walks. You know, that song that he sang, Jesus Walks With Me. And then he looked at, I took it back up, and he looked at me and he said, now what do you have to say? Because... That means I can be this way and still walk with Jesus. So I looked at him and I said, brother, how many songs has Kanye made for Jesus? The one. And that one means that it's okay. So I said, look, the Bible says that two cannot walk together except they be agreed. So I said, so the song, you may think it's okay, but let me ask you something. Do his works show that he's walking with God? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, what is he doing? Let's look at the principles of the Bible and then compare those principles with what Kanye West is doing. And look, Kanye West may be a great guy. He may be a lovely person. I don't personally know him, but I do know if he's sinning, he needs Jesus. Just as much as any one of us. So I asked this person, do his works line up to show that he's walking with God? And the person said, no. So I said, so what's the song then? So I said, could it be that they're trying to use that music avenue to get some Christians as well. Yes. Or to make you think that you can continue living a certain way and be connected to God at the same time. And then he looked at me and he said, you know what, that may be true. And today now you're getting many of the other artists who are coming up and making these Christian songs, but in the same breath, they're saying something totally different. So with this... Girl, be this damsel. It's an excellent demonstration of God showing. There's no middle ground with him. We're either with him or we're not. Is that clear for us? Now, praise God, because all of us have made a decision to be with him. Can we say amen? amen. So there's this lady. Now, look, the church is beginning to be built up. You've got Lydia and the damsel who had the demon rebuked. I don't believe that they would have just left her to nothing. They would have been able to guide her to Lydia's home. And I believe that this damsel started to form part of the church at Philippi. We continue reading now. Paul gets imprisoned. Now, how many of us, if we were Paul, would be upset at this? I had a vision. God, you told me to come to Macedonia. And now I'm in prison. I've been beaten. I've got stripes. And I'm in prison. Would we complain? 
Don't get me wrong, I don't want to go to any prison. <laughs> I've had to visit prisons. I've had to do prison ministry. It's not a nice place. But I do know that there's people in there that need to get the gospel. Amen. Sometimes prison for some is an opportunity to reflect on the life they've been lived in. Amen. But for those who have been wrongly imprisoned, it can become a place of complaint. Amen. But we don't read of Paul and Silas complaining there. In fact, if you look at verses 25 to 28, is this making sense to you all so far? Yes. Acts 16, verse 25 to 28. Look, look, look what happens. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas, what were they doing? They were praying and singing hymns to God. And it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. What were the prisoners doing? Listening. This is midnight. Some would say that everybody should be sleeping, but at this time, the whole prison house was listening to Paul and Silas praising God. So as I was reading this, I wanted to encourage you that in the midst of your difficulties, hmm. praise God. Amen. No matter what we are going through, if we ended up in prison, praise God. Yes. Make the place of your chains an opportunity to direct people to the most high. Yes. Because that's what Paul did. So they, they were singing these praises and then suddenly there was a great earthquake so the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately, how many doors were open? Oh. All the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. Now, this is a supernatural type of earthquake. Mm -hmm. The doors being open would make sense. Kind of. I'd expect some to still be closed. But then for everybody's chains to come up. Come on. Something supernatural was taking place. I want to let you know that in the midst of our problems, when we glorify God, it not only loses your chains, it loses the chains of others too. Amen. Opportunities that the church can provide give opportunity for other people's chains to be loosed. So you've got the, these chains been loosed. Now what would you do if you were one of the prisoners, one of the guilty ones? So what you would run, God, the dust would be seen at midnight. <coughs> But look what, look what takes place. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Isn't this, isn't this powerful? Can you picture what's taking place? You've got this man now. He wasn't on a double, on a king size mattress. He would have been sleeping in his house, in the type of houses that they had at that time. He's heard the earthquake, he's realized that everybody, the doors are open, everybody's chains are up. This, this jailer, who's responsible for all of these prisoners, according to the laws of Rome, if they get free because you were sleeping, you die. Yes. So this, this, this jailer pulls his sword and is about to kill himself. And what does Paul say? <laughs> look, look, look what happens. So, so supposing that they all fled, he draws his sword, he's about to kill himself. But call, call, Paul called. Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, we are all here. Then he calls for light, and then he comes down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brings them out and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Amen. What a change! Mm -hmm. This man has gone from having the sword just at his throat to now asking, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. What type of person are we dealing with? You have a jailer who has authority. He's recognized, not liked by many people. But he's the jailer. He thinks everybody's about to, to get away. He's in trouble. And the first thing that comes to mind is not prayer. It's not studying the word. It's let me take my own life because I'm not ready to deal with what's coming my way. He has a family. But the first thing that comes to his mind is suicide. Did you know that this is one of the big pandemic problems that are rising up in the world today? Suicide. People feeling that they've got no other hope, that they just need to take their own life. But we should be like the voice of Paul that should say, look, you don't need to do yourself any harm. Because we're all here. All of us have gone through different situations in life. Can we agree? Yes. But this jailer 
his whole house. It says, as we, as you, if you were to read through the rest of the text, he washed the stripes of Paul and Silas. He fed them. He dressed them. And then Paul and Silas preached the gospel to him and his whole household, and they were all saved. So look, what's making up the church at Philippi now is Lydia and her household, her team, the workers, the business. It's become Christian. You've got the damsel who was a possessed woman walking around the streets, bringing in money to the leaders who saved them in the church. And then you've got the jailer. It's literally that God was establishing a church that no matter how you got into Philippi, you would hear the gospel. If you heard of people that had experienced spiritualism, but they had a new life, they'd go to the damsel and talk. What did you go through? Somebody who's wanting to buy some purple, or they make contact with the business, let me tell you about Jesus Christ too. It would be as if Lydia would be able to put a tract, a, a gospel, some information, and just pass it over to them and say, read these words of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about him. And if, by any means, they ended up in prison. The jailer's there too. To let them know that you have hope. So when I read all of this and I understood, wow, this is, these were the first people who formed the church at Philippi. These were the ones who started the church. These were the ones that Paul wrote to. Paul visited Philippi around that year, AD 50. But when he wrote the book to the Philippian church, he was in prison. It would have been about 10 years later. And in closing, I'd just like to read some of those words with you. Go with me to the book of Philippians. And we're going to read verses 1 down to verse 11. And as we're reading, don't just read the book thinking, oh yeah, these are nice words. Read and have a picture in your mind that this letter has been read openly to the jailer and his whole household and their converts. It's been read to the damsel who was once possessed and all of the people who she knew. It's been read to Lydia and all of the household that she had. So maybe one of them could have been reading the letter. But what we do know is that hope was being still presented to the church. So listen to what Paul says now. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. It's as if Paul's writing and he's saying, I know that you're okay. The bishops and the deacons are there. You're all saints as well. In fact, they say in the book of Philippians, there's no condemnation. This was one of the churches that Paul loved with a huge amount of love. And they loved him. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, listen. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So as he's writing, he'd be thinking about the time when Lydia got baptized. The time when they reviewed the demon from the, dam from the damsel. The time when that jailer and the household was opened up. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So when he's saying this, it's not like me coming here and I'm still learning to know everybody in the church. Paul knew every single one of them from the beginning. And this is why when I'm reading the book of Philippians, it makes me think about this church because of the churches I've traveled around to and I've gone to, and I've had to work with as I'm leading out with peace and with doing Bible work or evangelism in different territories. This church is one of those churches where I've realized the members know each other. And I, I hear you talk. When one is going through a problem, you all know. When there's something going on, you communicate with each other. I believe that this is a type of church that if one was to go somewhere on a far land, you could write back and say, I'm praying for you all. I'm thinking about you. I'm in remembrance of you. That makes sense. And I'm telling you, you have such a blessing here in this place. But you need to continue. We need to continue going from strength to strength. Mm -hmm. Paul goes on, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, 
how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. So when you're reading this book now, think about the jailer. Who would have heard these words and would have been comforted to know Paul's still thinking about it. You know, this week I had a message from Pastor Apia. He said, he's, 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 happy. he's okay. When I got the message, it was comforting. I was like, he's okay. Give greetings to the family. But imagine when, when, if the church was to go through problems and all we had was a communication to write letters to each other. Mm. What would you say to each other? I'm thinking about it. I'm praying for you. I'm thanking God for every remembrance that I've had of you. Continue in the faith. Grow strong. We, we look forward to seeing Jesus Christ on that day. We do everything we could to encourage them in the letter, wouldn't we? And that's what Paul was doing. Now, in closing, you may think, well, the church at Philippi, great thing, excellent opportunity. But that church at Philippi, with those few people, they say that that was the first church that had the gospel preached that then went into the rest of Europe. In Europe today, there is over 740 million people. They say of the population of Europe that 74, 72% would say that they are Christians. Mm -hmm. So if we were to kind of round it up and I was to say, mm, you know, the, the, let's say 750 million, there's about 550 million who would say that they are Christians. Forget all the, 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 the denominations. They've heard of Jesus. They identify with him. Of that 750 million, 550 million say that they are Christians. Could it be possible that we would be able to say, because Paul, when he received that vision, he immediately acted upon it, mm -hmm. that we can give him thanks today. Mm -hmm. Not Paul, but give God thanks. Mm -hmm. Because of those opportunities, we had opportunity to hear the word. Then I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church because I believe that this church is the, the church that's going to give the last message. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a part of it. I believe we have a powerful message to spread to the whole world, but it needs to be shared in love. We need to be able to support those who we bring in, and we continue. So as the church, and I'm just letting you all know now, the soup kitchen that happened the other day, beautiful opportunity. When you see somebody come in and, and the church members are talking with them, beautiful opportunity. Wonderful food. When I came to Boston, they told me the food here is good. <laughs> and I have to testify, if I was to write a letter, I'd say, I hope the food is still good. <laughs> no, I'd probably say, I know it. But the thing is this, we have everything that we need to reach the community. Do you understand? And, and as that brother, Suki, came in, and he was willing to give his details because he's able to say, look, I'm okay to be contacted. He started telling me there's things he's going through in his home. And then as, as myself and Elder Griffiths were outside, and then there's another lady who comes down the street, and we just said hello. And then she's going into one of her family members' houses to go and look after them, and she would be willing to come here. On the 4th of July, soup kitchen day. But then as, as Elder Griffiths went, and I was just finishing up some work, and I was thinking about where I had to travel to that day, then a lady drives by in a BMW. Maybe she's a Lydia type of person. <laughs> she reverses the car and she comes around again, winds down the window, and I hear us calling, excuse me. Wound down the window, I said, yes, how can I help? And she said, did you have prayer here this morning? I saw the church open and I thought there was intercessory prayer taking place. I said, no, it was a soup kitchen. We can still come here for prayer later. <laughs> but the point I'm making is this. When the doors are open, people will come in. Yes. And when we make contact with them, as we grow with them, we will be able to say, like Paul, that he which has begun a good work in you, and I saw it begin. We know and we believe he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. All it needs is us to be willing to listen to the Macedonian call. That when God says, come, come here and help us. Come here and help us in Bilston. That we must be willing to say, let us go. Amen. 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 Amen.
Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege to just share what you're showing me in the book of Philippians. I pray that everybody here will grow in the fullness of Jesus Christ. That you, Father, will fill us with your Holy Spirit as we long for that day to see you face to face. But until then, may the work that you started in us be completed as we strive daily with you until we see you face to face. Help us to open the doors and to receive those who will come in. In Jesus' precious name we say. Amen. Amen.